a system of relations. On this subject, there was a famous controversy between him and Newton, the latter represented by Clark. The controversy remained undecided until the time of Einstein, whose theory conclusively gave the victory to Leibniz. The modern physicist, while he still believes that matter is in some sense atomic, does not believe in empty space. Where there is not matter, there is still something, notably light waves. Matter no longer has the lofty status that it acquired in philosophy through the arguments of Parmenides. It is not unchanging substance, but merely a way of grouping events. Some events belong to groups that can be regarded as material things. Others, such as light waves, do not. It is the events that are the stuff of the world, and each of them is of brief duration. In this respect, modern physics is on the side of Heraclitus, as against Parmenides. But it was on the side of Parmenides until Einstein and quantum theory. As regards space, the modern view is that it is neither a substance, as Newton maintained, and as Leucippus and Democritus ought to have said, nor an adjective of extended bodies, as Descartes thought, but a system of relations, as Leibniz held. It is not by any means clear whether this view is compatible with the existence of the void. Perhaps, as a matter of abstract logic, it can be reconciled with the void. We might say that between any two things there is a certain greater or smaller distance, and that distance does not imply the existence of intermediate things. Such a point of view, however, would be impossible to utilize in modern physics. Since Einstein, distance is between events, not between things, and involves time as well as space. It is essentially a causal conception, and in modern physics there is no action at a distance. All this, however, is based upon empirical rather than logical grounds. Moreover, the modern view cannot be stated except in terms of differential equations, and would therefore be unintelligible to the philosophers of antiquity. It would seem, accordingly, that the logical development of the views of the atomists is the Newtonian theory of absolute space, which meets the difficulty of attributing reality to not being. To this theory there are no logical objections. The chief objection is that absolute space is absolutely unknowable, and cannot therefore be a necessary hypothesis in an empirical science. The more practical objection is that physics can get on without it. But the world of the atomists remains logically possible, and is more akin to the actual world than is the world of any other of the ancient philosophers. Democritus worked out his theories in considerable detail, and some of the working out is interesting. Each atom, he said, was impenetrable and indivisible because it contained no void. When you use a knife to cut an apple, the knife has to find empty places where it can penetrate. If the apple contained no void, it would be infinitely hard and therefore physically indivisible. Each atom is internally unchanging and, in fact, a Parmenidean one. The only things that atoms do are to move and hit each other, and sometimes to combine when they happen to have shapes that are capable of interlocking. They are of all sorts of shapes. Fire is composed of small spherical atoms, and so is the soul. Atoms, by collision, produce vortices, which generate bodies and ultimately worlds. There are many worlds, some growing, some decaying. Some may have no sun or moon, some several. Every world has a beginning and an end. A world may be destroyed by collision with a larger world. This cosmology may be summarized in Shelley's words. Worlds on worlds are rolling ever from creation to decay like the bubbles on a river, sparkling, bursting, borne away. Life developed out of the primeval slime. There is some fire everywhere in a living body, but most in the brain or in the breast. On this authorities differ. Thought is a kind of motion, and is thus able to cause motion elsewhere. Perception and thought are physical processes. Perception is of two sorts, one of the senses, one of the understanding. Perceptions of the latter sort depend only on the things perceived, while those of the former sort depend also on our senses and are therefore apt to be deceptive. Like Locke, Democritus held that such qualities as warmth, taste, and color are not really in the object, but are due to our sense organs, while such qualities as weight, density, and hardness are really in the object. 
Democritus was a thoroughgoing materialist. For him, as we have seen, the soul was composed of atoms, and thought was a physical process. There was no purpose in the universe. There were only atoms governed by mechanical laws. He disbelieved in popular religion, and he argued against the noose of Anaxagoras. In ethics, he considered cheerfulness the goal of life, and regarded moderation and culture as the best means to it. He disliked everything violent and passionate. He disapproved of sex because, he said, it involved the overwhelming of consciousness by pleasure. He valued friendship, but thought ill of women, and did not desire children because their education interferes with philosophy. In all this, he was very like Jeremy Bentham. He was equally so in his love of what the Greeks called democracy. Footnote. Poverty in a democracy is as much to be preferred to what is called prosperity under despots as freedom is to slavery, he says. End of footnote. Democritus, such at least is my opinion, is the last of the Greek philosophers to be free from a certain fault which vitiated all later ancient and medieval thought. All the philosophers we have been considering so far were engaged in a disinterested effort to understand the world. They thought it easier to understand than it is, but without this optimism they would not have had the courage to make a beginning. Their attitude in the main was genuinely scientific, wherever it did not merely embody the prejudices of their age. But it was not only scientific. It was imaginative and vigorous and filled with a delight of adventure. They were interested in everything, meteors and eclipses, fishes and whirlwinds, religion and morality. With a penetrating intellect, they combined the zest of children. From this point onwards, there are first certain seeds of decay, in spite of previously unmatched achievement, and then a gradual decadence. What is amiss, even in the best philosophy after Democritus, is an undue emphasis on man as compared with the universe. First comes skepticism with the sophists, leading to a study of how we know rather than to the attempt to acquire fresh knowledge. Then comes, with Socrates, the emphasis on ethics. With Plato, the rejection of the world of sense in favor of the self-created world of pure thought. With Aristotle, the belief in purpose as the fundamental concept in science. In spite of the genius of Plato and Aristotle, their thought has vices which proved infinitely harmful. After their time, there was a decay of vigor and a gradual recrudescence of popular superstition. A partially new outlook arose as a result of the victory of Catholic orthodoxy. But it was not until the Renaissance that philosophy regained the vigor and independence that characterized the predecessors of Socrates.